All right, guys, little little technical difficulty there. Uh, that was pretty funny. Chris Ye and I just had like a really great conversation, <laughs> but then we realized we're not live, uh, thanks to my team. So um, we're going to just get right back into it. Welcome, everyone, to CEO Check-In. The Go Big tip today is to pick your numbers, your key numbers to follow in your business. Peter Drucker, the famous management consultant and educator, famously said, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So in your own business, even if you're small, even if you're just starting out, what are those key numbers you need to track? You know, for us, we track signups to my newsletter. We track people who convert into joining one of our programs. What are the key numbers that you're tracking? Get your whole team on board with them. Get everybody rowing in the same direction, and you will grow so much faster that way. So I want to introduce my guest today. Chris Ye is co-author of Blitzscaling, which I have right here. Fantastic book. I've just been devouring it over the last few weeks. And he's also the co-founder of the Global Scaling Academy. Now, you may be wondering, what is Blitzscaling? Is that something I'm even interested in? So Blitzscaling is when companies decide to go very big, very fast. Think LinkedIn, think Facebook, think Twitter, think eBay. These are all companies that went on this rocket ship ride to building teams, to getting customers, to building out their companies in a really rapid way. So just as a small example, I'm going to read you a couple of pages from the beginning of Blitzscaling. Um, and so Amazon, perfect example, okay? Amazon's incredible growth is a prime example of Blitzscaling. In 1996, a pre-IPO Amazon Books had 151 employees and revenues of 5.1 million. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? 5.1 million to most of us. But by 1999, four years later, the now public Amazon.com, they changed their name, you might not remember, I do, from Amazon Books to Amazon.com, had grown to 7,600 employees and generated revenues of 1.6 billion. So that's a 50 times increase in staff and a 322 times increase in revenues in three years. I said four before, but it was three. So that's an example of blitz scaling. Now, this is not something all of us want to do, all of us are ready to do, but there are so many lessons from the businesses that did blitz scale and they're businesses that you were use every single day, right? Uber, Twitter, um, all these businesses that have created this huge networks and that are now just a part of our daily lives, many of them blitzscaled. And we're going to find out from Chris Ye, the co-author of Blitzscaling, how they did it and what lessons we can learn from that. So let me bring Chris on. Here we go. Here comes Chris Ye. So excited to have you with us. Hi, Bianca. I see some of our, our usuals have turned up. That's nice. Hello, Nicole. Hey, Chris. Welcome. Hi, Julia. Sorry about that. This is my very first Instagram Live, and obviously uh, there are a few bumps and bruises along the way for somebody who's an Instagram office, but I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm so happy you're here. I know you're a dad, too, and I was teaching my 12-year-old how to make rice the other day, and I was like, just follow the instructions. So I came out, and the pot was, like, boiling over with rice and water. I was like, what happened here? And he was like, look, I followed the instructions. It said two cups of rice. I was like, no, no, that's two servings. That's two servings. <laughs> it's half a cup of rice. But here's the thing. He'll never, ever make that mistake again. Now it's done. And now you know how to go live. Absolutely. And the, the funny thing, I think what it was is that um, because I was waiting for you to go live, I, yes. I think that at least on my phone, the way Instagram works, it wasn't updating and showing that you were live unless I actually pulled down and, and refreshed the page. And so that was the, the lesson that I learned. Well, listen, two entrepreneurs, we were going to find a way, right, to get you on here. So thank you. So Absolutely. Happy you're here. And, you know, I would love to just, one, say congratulations on this incredible book. It's so chock full of practical tips and great examples and relatable stories about what it really took to build these companies that are now everyday brands we refer to, you know, Airbnb and Twitter and LinkedIn and PayPal. So just loved it. Thank you. What a huge contribution you've made to the entrepreneurial landscape. And, you know, I had eight big takeaways that I would love to share with you if you'll indulge me. And then let's jump in because one of these might prompt, you know, something we can talk about. So Absolutely. Let's, let's do it. 
Let's do it. Awesome. All right, you just get to sit back. You wrote the book. Now you get to sit back and hear what somebody learned from it. So one, when do we blitz scale, right? This book helps us figure out, are you a company that could be a multi-billion dollar company that could grow super fast like Amazon? Or should you take a slightly slower and steadier approach? Two, the importance of predicting your total available market in the future. We can all go do research and predict our available market now, but where is the world going? Changes like AI and driverless cars, and how is that all going to alter our universe and the new businesses that will get funded and blitz scale in the future because of it? You talked about the stages of a business and really understanding, are you at the family stage, one to five employees? Are you at the tribe stage, maybe five to 20 employees? And on up through village, city, and nation, which is 10,000 plus employees. What a useful way of breaking down where companies are at and helping us to think about what do we need at each stage, which you did in the book. You talked about how investors want bees, baby. That's a direct quote, right, from when Brian Chesky was uh, pitching Airbnb, and I believe it was someone from Y Combinator who said, love, 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 but change the M of 30 million to B, 30 billion, and we'll get you funded. And that's something that comes up a lot in our community where women will just kind of project a little too small, right? And we help them think bigger. Uh, then which fires to let burn? God, I love that one, Chris. I've not heard people talking about that. It is so important that as an entrepreneur to know which things have to be dealt with immediately in urgency and urgently and which things, yeah, they're going wrong. They suck. You talked about a PayPal. You had all these angry customers at one point, but you decided, no, we're going to let that fire burn because we have other more urgent fires to blitz scaling we have to put out now. Fantastic. The five categories of network effects in our networked age. Any entrepreneur today has to understand how the networks you know, affect our business models. So that was fantastic. The planning fallacy about thinking that you make a plan, it's going to go according to plan, never does. Thank you for breaking that down. And last but not least, I was really thrilled that you found ways to apply blitz scaling to nonprofits, politics, and small businesses, because all those examples were so rich and will help people to use these methods that have mainly been used by the big billion dollar companies, but also Obama used them in getting elected and nonprofits like Charity Water you talked about use them to grow super quickly. So that was just uh, my quick eight takeaways. And I'd love to hear, you know, what you want to talk about in terms of how this all in affects small businesses, because that's really who we're addressing here on the show. Yeah, no, and I think you did a fantastic job of pulling out some of the very important takeaways. I especially love the fact that you mentioned the, uh, that blitz scaling applies outside of business, because really I think that there's a, it's a powerful framework. It can't always be applied, but usually some element of it can be applied, because blitz scaling is all about how do you move more quickly and how do you think bigger. And gosh, I feel like everyone always needs to move more quickly, and everyone needs to think bigger. So a uh, huge pleasure on that. I think that you know the really interesting question for blitz scaling, and which business owners, like the ones who might be listening in, are asking themselves is, how can I tell if I'm pursuing a blitz scaling opportunity? When do I know it's the right time to blitz scale? And something that is not in the book, but is something we've developed since then, so this extra added value for people who happen to be tuning in, is that of the key elements of blitz scaling, there are two elements that are the ones that set the blitz scaling opportunities apart. And so those two elements are the network effects or winner take most market dynamics. So uh, we talk about network effects in the book, but there are occasionally times when there's a different winner take most dynamic that generally is based on a land grab element. And we talk in the book about things like the land grab element to Chesapeake Energy and its leases on oil and gas, for example. Where and Airbnb, there's also right? Airbnb, I didn't realize had this big competitor nipping at their heels in the early days. That's right. And in a way, that could be a good thing. I mean, I actually experienced that with my language teaching company, Little Pim. We heard rumors that the biggest player in our language teaching space was going to create a children's product. And I just remember thinking, oh, no, they can't have my lunch. Like, I'm going on offense. And that's when I went and raised venture capital and took up a lot of market share because I knew I had to. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, exactly. So when it comes to something like a land grab or a network effect, the real question is, you know, once you win that market, does it stay one? Because if you win the market and then you retain that market leadership for decades or, you know, some period of time that's long enough, 
then that's the real reward. Because while you own that market, while you're the enduring market leader, you can print money. And if you look at a company like Facebook or a company like Apple or a company like Amazon, that's really what drives their business, the fact that they are the overwhelming dominant market leader. Now, the thing about applying blitzscaling to your own company is, you know, even it may seem like, oh, wow, it, it, I can't really compare myself to an Amazon. I'm not a $1 trillion company. I don't have, you know, millions of workers and all that sort of thing. Well, the thing is that winner-take-most markets exist more locally as well. So if you look at, you know, for example, let, let's say you, are, you have a business within a particular geography. That's the way things used to be. It used to be that most businesses were local, and some of them still are. And where you have a local business, it may still make sense to pursue that market leadership within the local area. As many people have discovered over the years, you become the dominant car dealer, you become the dominant real estate broker. That's still a very powerful franchise. Here in Palo Alto, there's a very famous real estate broker named Ken DeLeon. And Ken DeLeon has pursued a blitzscaling strategy. And he is a real estate broker here in, in Palo Alto that has sold all these different houses, and he did it in a very clever way. What happened was that Ken DeLeon found a partner over in China, and he was the first one to establish the pipeline of Chinese billionaires to Palo Alto to buy property. And he did all sorts of things that people might think are insane, like at a Palo Alto real estate broker advertising in China. That's kind of crazy, right? That well, seems that, pretty well, inefficient. That's part of that total available market future prediction. Exactly. Right? Exactly. He, he saw a market. That was already a big thing. He was like, no, this can become a big thing. And I think that was one of my takeaways from the book, that you have to be able to do this kind of future prediction. Because if it was already a big thing, probably somebody else would be on it already, right? And Precisely. And define those terms for our audience. You talked about winner take most. I think yeah. most people are familiar with the term winner take all. Help us understand the difference. Yeah, so winner take most and winner take all are to some extent interchangeable. The reason is a true winner take all market is pretty rare. That means that there's nobody else who can, pe who can compete. And if you look even at something that's a company that's as dominant as, for example, Facebook, it doesn't mean there's no other social networks or a company that's as dominant as Apple. doesn't mean there's no other smartphones. So winner take most just means that, you know, there can be people bumping along, but the winner is still the one that captures the lion's share of the market and the value. Uh, there's an interesting question. So let's get interactive as well. I see a question coming in over the chat, which is, can imposter syndrome be good in the beginning of blitzscaling? It depends on how you channel that imposter syndrome. So one of the things that people feel like is, oh my gosh, you know, I, ha I, I can't believe I'm going after becoming one of the world's iconic companies. How could that ever happen? How could that be me? And, you know, my answer to that is generally, well, you know, this imposter syndrome is not necessarily realistic it, because, yes, it's hard to get there, but all the people started off somewhere. Steve Jobs started off as a, a guy who dropped out of college who was forced to work the night shift because he refused to believe he needed to wear deodorant. He smelled so bad that that was the only job he could get. Or Brian Chesky and his friends over at Airbnb, you know, they had seventy thousand dollars in credit card debt and ten visitors a day, right? And this was this and is then, not. And then they actually is, went and photographed the apartments themselves, right? Because people weren't that's right. good photos. That's a it's a great story. Yeah, and I I love right. what you're sharing about that in terms of imposter syndrome, and you know, we know that mindset is such a big part, right, of whether we go after our dreams or not. I know we share an interest in that, and the fact that most entrepreneurs who've made it, they were able to quiet down those voices in their minds, right? That are saying, oh, they're not going to believe you or, you know, exactly. they're not going to get the funding. I always say, you know, no one's going to believe in you more than you believe in you. Yeah. So, now, the other thing I would say about imposter syndrome is if the book, uh, if the book actually ends, uh, sorry, if the imposter syndrome actually drives you to work harder, to uh, be more aggressive, to do all these different things to overcome it, then it might be helpful. I just personally don't think it's psychologically healthy. And, you know, someone was asking, is this similar to Reed Hoffman's book? So this is co-authored by Chris Ye and Reed Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. That is the same book, the one and only. And, you know, I'd love to get into something you talked about in the book where you said, you know, yes, these billion dollar companies are doing a lot of good for the world in the sense that they're creating platforms that then allow other innovative companies to pop up and they're creating jobs and they're helping our economy. But there's also a risk, right, that they could 
one become monopolies, right? We're seeing all this now with the trials of Google and Facebook. And then there's also an imperative to, to help and be part of the solution. So I'm gonna just read one quote from the book and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You wrote, we believe the responsibilities of a blitz scaler go beyond simply maximizing shareholder value. You are responsible for how the actions of your business impact the larger society. Talk to me about that a little. Yes, I mean, I think that we argue for the notion of being responsible on two different levels. One is the moral level. So if you think about it, you know, the reason you're able to scale a business in society is because of all the rules that exist, all the infrastructure that exists. If you hire people, guess what? Those people were educated by an educational system. If you're able to operate with contracts and laws, that's because there's a government that actually enforces those contracts and laws. So when you do something to actually damage the society that you grow within, you know, that's terrible, right? It's, it's like cancer. It's, it's something that is just really negative. And I think far too often people hide behind this notion of, well, it's a free market and my only job is to make as much money as possible. I'm like, that's a bunch of bullshit. And you know it because ultimately you live as a part of that society. And if you, you need to be able to live with yourself at night. Now, the other reason is just the practical, pragmatic reason is we're seeing with Google, Facebook, and all these other companies, if you do not act responsibly, then somebody else will decide, you're too powerful, I have to make sure that you act responsibly. So we often say that responsible self-regulation is going to forestall government regulation, which may, which may or may not be written with the idea of what you're actually doing in mind, right? If you know, you know your business better than anyone else, and if you use that knowledge to act responsibly and make sure their company is, is actually contributing to society, it's unlikely that politicians are going to come in and say, we have to break this up or we have to change this. But if you act irresponsibly, that may drive certain higher profits or revenues in the short term. But in the long run, it's going to lead to society deciding we cannot stand for this and we're going to have to do something about it. Well, and, and thank you for addressing that in the book, because I think that's a hot topic right now. I know a lot of people in my community, you know, watch the documentary and I'm blanking on the name a minute, you know, about the social know, menace. Thank, well, the social menace. No, I think. It had what is it? The social something. And yeah, that, that would be too obvious. It was like the social yeah. something a little less uh, damning than that. But yes, it's... it's I was confusing it with the Star Wars movie. movie. Oh, there we go. <laughs> well, I think it just got people thinking of like, right, when I'm scrolling, you know, someone's benefiting from this. Uh, people are profiting off of my attention. I was with my trainer this morning in the gym and we were talking about, you know, oh, yeah, all our devices are spying on us. He mentioned he had taught one of his training clients how to use kettlebells. The guy never even heard of kettlebells. And then he said, oh, I went home later that day and I was getting fed all ads for kettlebells. So like, right, the phone was listening in on him. So yeah, creepy things are happening and we do have to hold these blitz scaled companies responsible, right, for being good moral actors as well. And I know that in my community, it's not just about making money, it's really about the social impact right here at Million Dollar Women, we want to help women build seven and eight figure companies, but almost all those women want to use some of those profits to give back, whether through scholarships, whether through joining nonprofit boards. So I can see that's a big part of your ethos as well. Have you taken some heat since Blitzscaling came out around, you know, are we celebrating these Blitzscalers too much? Why the name? I did see some controversy, so I'd love to hear you talk about that. Yes. So as a matter of fact, there has been some controversy. The main controversy actually hasn't been about the name, although that was something we were worried about. Obviously, blitzscaling is a bit of a takeoff on blitzkrieg, which is a term for more. It's not something that most people remember fondly. There are a few people who remember it fondly, and those people scare me. So that is always something we're aware of. Um, but we explain in the book why we use it. You did, term. and you explained that well. Even as a Jewish person, I was like, okay, you guys get a pass. You can use it once I saw the explanation. But the other element, the other element of it, it's there's a, there's a lot of people who feel like, you know, blitz scaling is just wrong. And the only way, the best way to build companies is to build them slowly over time, to build them with profits and not to raise money from venture capitalists and all these things. And I'm like, look, there are plenty of businesses for which that is true. We never claim that blitz scaling is something that always applied to every company. We just said that there are certain market circumstances under which it is the dominant strategy. And a lot of people have taken it, unfortunately, to just sort of say, well, blitz scaling is an excuse that I can use to raise a lot of money and spend it on advertising versus something which you need to be thoughtful about. Absolutely. You do make the point that when you're blitz scaling, you are privileging fast growth over operational efficiencies and even 
saying we are going to make a ton of mistakes we are going to waste some money because that's the only way that we can get big fast i think you liken it to uh jumping out of a plane and building the parachute on the way down is that was that the metaphor yes yeah, so so if you the uh, the classic the classic metaphor is that jumping off a, if you're jumping off a cliff and building the airplane on the way down and that reflects the fact that when you start something new the default outcome is failure it's hard to succeed doing something new and so you have to be incredibly rapid you have to really work like a maniac in order to just stave off the natural results of death and it's not for everyone right i mean i yeah. just wrote this book on mindset right go big now about what mindset do you need to pursue big ambitious dreams and not everyone is in that frame of mind or wants to go on that ride right so maybe you can help explain and i do want to take more questions um oh you're getting lots of love here and lots of questions um maybe you could just quickly explain what types of businesses are appropriate for blitz scaling and which one should take a slightly more traditional route Absolutely. So the two things you're really looking for are a winner take most market and scalable distribution. The winner take most market is the dynamic that determines whether or not blitz scaling is appropriate. And usually it's happening because there is some sort of network effect. And what a network effect is is as the network grows bigger, the value of the network to each individual user increases as well. And so the dynamic is as your network grows bigger, the value of your product to your users keeps going and growing and growing and beyond a certain point your competitors can come in they can give their product away for free or they can even pay people to use it and it's still not enough they can't overcome the massive value that you get from the, the network well, like if, if for example the example of that right just for so yes. you can visualize it because when you guys first started it was like well if there aren't enough people there then what's the point of joining but now that everyone's there and it's become kind of the go to resume right people just go right to linkedin i always tell my women google yourself you'll see linkedin comes up first so you better make sure that looks fantastic even before your website often and that's the network effect right chris absolutely absolutely that's precisely what you're talking about and that network effect is essential and then the other element is the scalable distribution which is you know the goal of blitzkin is to get to critical scale the distribution determines whether or not you can do it how long it takes and how much it costs And so really what you're looking for is some sort of differentiated go to market. So that's not just raise a lot of money and spend it on advertising. Look, people say, "Oh, just spend a lot of money." I'm like, "No, no, you could take the money, put it in a pile, light it on fire. That will do nothing for your business, <laughs> right? You have to find ways to spend money that actually improve the scale of your company. And there's nothing wrong with being efficient in figuring out ways to grow. You just want to do it quickly." Well, I think you also mentioned this idea that you should also do things that are not scalable. in order to see what works could you explain that a little bit and then i have a question from absolutely so so one of the things that people do is they try to figure out okay well how is this going to scale to a million users or 10 million users or 100 million or whatever the case may be and the fact is that things are going to change so much between now and then that whatever you're doing now you're going to change it anyways so don't worry about getting everything right and getting things in place that are going to last a thousand years get things right for right now and just understand you're going to be refactoring in 6 months to a year anyways. And so doing things that don't scale it means doing things in a non-scale way is often the fastest way to get to scale. And after you get to scale you'll figure out a way to make it more scalable. I love that. And and my understanding of that is that you could even do things like build an excel spreadsheet that manages a certain process you know not scalable at all but in doing so you'll really see what elements do i need before you go pay a bunch of programmers to build the super fancy expensive version is that what you're talking about absolutely that? and i think you're referring to an example in the book where the founders of airbnb discovered that the most important thing for the success of the company was making sure that there was good photographs of the apartments they were being rented out So step 1 was we go to New York City and we take the photographs ourselves as founders, right? Clearly unscalable, but it allowed them to get a lot of their early users on board. Then it was pay our friends to do these photographs and track that in an Excel spreadsheet. And then eventually it was like, well, shoot, this is taking so long. Okay, have an intern manage the Excel spreadsheet. And finally when an intern cannot as their full-time job keep up with the spreadsheet, then it was time to build the automation. But that was an example of how doing things that were eminently unscalable were actually the fastest easiest ways to get to the next stage. 
I love that. That was a great example that everyone who has a business can relate to. I think I was thinking of an example from my own business because I did that so many times. But thank you for reminding us of the Airbnb example. I love that one. So somebody is asking, what if using blitz scaling to augment the valuation of the company? I use it as a method to get feedback from my network. That's yeah, so if you think about... So if you think about blitz scaling, I mean, it is going to augment the valuation of your company if you're in a blitz scalable market, because what you'll be doing is you'll be laying out a more aggressive vision for your potential investors, and they'll see, here is why this company could be worth a lot of money. Now, think about the news that we just heard recently. Clubhouse, which is the new audio social network, just raised money, $100 million from Andreessen Horowitz at a $1 billion valuation. I was just talking with somebody who was an investor in Andreessen Horowitz, and they're, they're, they, weren't, you know, they weren't a startup guy. And a very famous person outside of the startup world, and, and he was saying, how can a company that has zero revenues be worth a billion dollars? And my response was, the vision, and again, not saying that this is guaranteed to come about, but their vision is to be the audio social network as opposed to the text-based social network or the video social network. I'm like, think about how valuable being the dominant player as an audio social network could potentially be. Yes, they have zero revenues now, but if they succeed, they could be worth $100 billion. And so the question that Andreessen Horowitz asked itself is, what are the chances that they succeed? And they paid a price that is not justified by current revenues at all, obviously, but may or may not end up being justified based on where it ends up and whether or not it achieves that dominant market position. Absolutely. And, you know, I was just listening to Clubhouse earlier today because it's, it's everywhere right now. Everyone's inviting you in and their rooms and, you know, we don't quite totally understand the value it's bringing yet, but it's certainly getting a lot of buzz. And so they're obviously going after that approach of, you know, take the most of the market that they possibly can. I would, yes. I would and, and I have that. thoughts on that. I'm happy to share my thoughts on uh, later, you know, not on this live on what you could do to get the most out of Clubhouse because having observed it for a week or two, I think I have some new ideas. Oh, that's very cool. Maybe just share one that you can say publicly, because I do think a lot of people watching are on Clubhouse like I am, wondering, you know, how do I make the most of this? So, um, so if you guys uh, try to take notes on this one. So the main thing that's going on with Clubhouse is the user dynamics is incredibly powerful. But what you want is you want to find things that people want to talk about. And right now, Clubhouse is a wasteland of people talking about startups, people doing self-help topics, and people talking about relationships. And those are great, I guess, but they're just not mainstream enough. So what I would do is I would look, if I were starting a clubhouse room and I wanted to do a bunch of clubhouse broadcasts, I would try to peg it off something that was happening in the real world. So, for example, think about how the Daily pod, the Daily at New York Times, which does a podcast about the day's events, is so popular, or the Daily Show or all these things. You should be doing a Daily Show on current events. That's one niche. Right? There could be another niche that's based on what movie just came out. So there's all these things that you could be doing where you're tapping into what people already, uh, what people already care about and what they like talking about. And the first mover advantage, right? Whoever goes and creates that first could be the dominant force there. I know that when I got on Instagram, soon thereafter Instagram Stories launched, and it was like anybody who was on Instagram Stories got so much more attention, and now everybody's yeah. on there, and it's harder to get the attention again. So I'm sure there's value to being there. early. There's value to placing the bet, and that's what Andreessen Horowitz is doing. They're placing an early bet. They have the conviction to do so, even though even their own investors are like, what, a billion dollars for a company with no revenues? Well, listen, I would love to end with what are a couple of blitz scaling takeaways that apply to small businesses, since that's my main audience. I will share one that I love seeing in the book, which was the paying attention to your gross margins. Because people are sometimes chasing revenue and new customers in a way that ignores the gross margin conversation. And you pointed out a lot of investors, that's one of the first things they're paying attention to, right? If you can have those 70, 80, 90% gross margins, that's a really exciting business. So that applies to all businesses. What, what are a couple of other things? So one of the things, and it's on top of mind, because I was just talking with an entrepreneur I'm advisor for who's going through blitzscaling right now, and sadly he had been so busy he hadn't checked in with me on certain things. And that is uh, we have this counterintuitive rule called hire Ms. Right Now, not Ms. Right. And we have this tendency in life to think that when we're going to hire someone, we want to hire someone who's going to be with us for the next 50 years and take the company to being a trillion-dollar company. And the fact is that the person who's really good at working at a big scale may not necessarily know how to work at a small scale. And so you really need to focus on what are your needs right now when you're hiring people. Like thinking too far ahead 
that's dangerous. You're going to bring in people who aren't suited for your current stage. And that's, in fact, what this entrepreneur had done. He said, oh, I, I, you know, I, now I've raised a Series A. I've got a lot of money. I hired these people who came in from these big organizations. And they came in like, what the hell is going on here? we got to stop everything. Everything is broken. And I'm like, oh, my God, you didn't talk to me about hiring before you did this hire. And I explained and I to him. And they were expensive, yeah. too, right? If you're hiring, and they were expensive. You know, and, and he'll fix it. But the point is, he should have said, I'm going to hire people who are, I need right now to get me from $5 million to $50 million. I'm not hiring the person who understands $5 billion because being at $5 billion is totally different from being at $5 million and needing to get to $50 million. I love that. And, and just to break that down even further for people watching who maybe are even just hiring their first few employees, sometimes you're not even ready to hire a full-time employee. And that's okay. Right. You can hire a part-time, a VA. The important thing is to just start moving in that direction. And you can always replace that person later with someone who's more expensive, more full-time, more senior, more experienced, all that good stuff. So yeah, great advice. I remember that from yeah. the book. Hire Ms. And I like they use the woman. Hire Ms. right now, not Ms. right. Is that it? Language matters, absolutely. It does, yes. And, and big shout out to your wife for buying all those toys for little girls and making sure they're not all getting blonde Barbie dolls. Because I grew up with all the blonde Barbie dolls and always wanted to be a girl with blonde hair named Susan until I was 10. Why was that? Because I grew up with all these friggin' Barbies. So thank your wife for me on <laughs> that one. Will do, will do. <laughs> awesome. And this was so much fun, Chris. Thank you for how you're helping so many entrepreneurs figure out how they can go big and making great decisions about their companies. Everybody should get a copy of Blitz Scaling. You will read it obsessively as I did. Mine is full of underlined and notes and stuff. And Chris, have an awesome day. Thank you for joining us. And you are now Instagram Live trained. Woohoo! I know. This is fantastic. I have to do it myself, Julia. Thank you so much for, for having me on. I want to just mention, and you mentioned it briefly, you buried the lead, that you have a book that you're working on that I actually just provided a blurb for, The Go Big uh, Mindset, and Thank it's going to be a fantastic you. book, and everyone should be pre-ordering that as soon as it's available. I'm sure Julia will let you know. Oh, I so appreciate the shout-out. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day, and thanks for coming on. Bye, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you for making my first Instagram Live a fun experience. We'll always look back fondly on it. <laughs> we Thank always you. have Instagram Live. Bye. Have a good day. Awesome. That Goodbye, everyone. Awesome. Oh, he did great, right, for our first Instagram Live. We were chatting for a little while, not here on live. We, were, we didn't know we were not live. We were having a great time, but you guys weren't there. So thank goodness for my team. We're like, you're not live. Uh, thanks, guys. Anyway, such great value in this split scaling book. I don't know about you guys, but I read a business book about every two weeks. Um, I just ordered one called uh, The Billion Dollar Whale, I think it was called. And this is one of the benefits, right, of doing an Instagram Live is that you get to hear from your guests about what they're reading, what they're thinking about. I think that uh, Blitz Scaling came as a recommendation from one of my guests. Thanks so much for being with us today. The book Chris mentioned, by the way, is my new book coming out March 30th. It's available for pre-order on Amazon. It's called Go Big Now, Eight Essential Mindset Practices to Overcome Any Obstacle and Reach Your Goals. So what is the mindset to blink scale? They don't cover that in this book, but I do in Go Big Now. So check it out if you're interested. Have a great day, and I will see you back here next week for CEO Check-In Wednesday at noon Eastern. Have a great day and check out my pretty sparkly earrings because this is where I'm wearing them right here on Instagram TV and hopefully out in the real world at some point soon. Bye.